there we are. So please, um, could you please keep a track of time because I have no, no clock here. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ayatis Bernardu, and this is a post-lunch session. Usually, this is a tricky one. We will do our best not to um, let you fall asleep. Um, it's, um, it's, a very, um, it's a very special occasion here uh, for me today because it was at the very last in-person digital humanities event in Utrecht in 2019 that I presented this, um, this uh, project as a short presentation. It, back then it was a project proposal in the making. So now it's a, it's a full body project, it's about to be finished, so I'm very happy to be here today and I, I wish I could see myself four years ago giving this presentation here for you today. So this building that you see in this picture, it's the, it's the digital reproduction of what is block 15. Um, it's actually this physical building, um, it, it's still standing and it is a building within the the still active um, army camp of Haidari in the western part of Attica, that's the reg region of Athens. So this building, which is now no longer in use and it's been declared a monument, Block 15, as you can see, um, was, um, was used as a torture and isolation building during 1943. In 1944, while the Haidari camp, the army camp, was uh, used as a concentration camp by the German occupators. So this is how the building looks today. It has been renovated and repainted um, on the outside as well as on the inside. It used to be in, um, in, to be in function until 1984 when the then government declared it um, a monument. So a few words about how we stand in Greece with regards to such uh, heritage, such contested or difficult or sensitive, call it as you may, heritage. So we discuss a lot about it. It's still vibrant in public dialogue in Greece, and I mean, the recent election, um, which brought into our parliament um, extreme right parties, even brings the discussion into, into a more focal point lately. But despite the fact that the German occupation, which lasted for about four years, um, three or four years from 1941 to 1944, it's central in public discussion, it inspires um, films or cinema productions, it, in, it inspires uh, visual artists, it, in, it even inspires, of course, writers, fiction. It's the actual sites of memory are not visible at all. So if you, I mean, if, you, if we were now in Athens, and I have given this presentation quite a few times in Greece, and I would ask you, have you heard about Block 15 and the Haidari concentration camp? Chances were that only one or two of you would raise their arms. Why is that? It is what it is. Uh, Haid it is because of our education system. It's because, you know, we tend to ignore the actual topography of horror in Greece, per se. So, as I said, and I will reiterate it again quite a few times, the Haidari concentration camp was the second biggest in Greece. The first one was the Pavlos Melas camp up north in Thessaloniki. Um, about 20,000 people were deported uh, from this uh, place uh, to the more, more famous, um, notoriously famous uh, camps um, in northern Central Europe. So it's not just this, that this building um, is unknown um, to the wider public, Greek public or European public or international public. It's also another, there's also another issue with it. And the issue is that it's inaccessible. So physically you cannot access it because A, it lies within an active army camp. So in Greece, I don't know about your countries, but in my country, Greece, you cannot just walk into an army camp and visit any other building. You need special permissions. And also, you need to have permission from the municipality of Haidari. And also, and apart from that, you also need an extra permission from the Ministry of Culture. I think I've made it pretty clear that um, it's a building that's not only unknown, it's invisible to, to public discourse in Greece right now. So what I'm here to talk about uh, is, um, is a project that's being hosted by the Department of Informatics, Athens University of Economics and Business. 
uh, a project that started in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic, and it's hopefully going to end uh, by mid-2024. Uh, it's co-financed, and this is very important, and we're very honored um, for that, by the German Federal Foreign Office through the funds from the German Greek um, Fund for the Future, and also the Greek Ministry of Culture. So both countries involved in whatever happened in the horrors that took place in this particular um, particular building and surroundings uh, are, are supporting us. So um, what are we working on? Um, we are working on an immersive production, a 3D story-driven interactive exploration of the concentration camp, that's the Haidari concentration camp, particularly focusing on the building that is Block 15. So the way we're going, to, we're going about it was carry out extensive historical and archival research and then working towards an interactive scenario, that's digital storytelling, to which will work as the backbone or the structure of the, of the uh, final production. And what you see here are screen grabs from the 2D of the final production, and you'll get the opportunity to see a video right at the end of my presentation. So as I said, what, the way we see digital storytelling in this particular project is the backbone the mediator, the bridge, call it as you may, between the historical information and all the archival resources that we had to employ and to go through and to incorporate and to organize and to curate, and the final immersive production. So it was a way to, if you'd like, to serve, to serve the history to the final audience, the digital storytelling. And this is where things start getting interesting. So how do you, do you go about creating an interactive scenario in which the user slash visitor can go around a certain, a certain um, environment if that environment is a concentration camp? So what we wanted to do, what we did not want to do rather, was to create like a virtual guided tour or a, you know, just a virtual documentary, 3D documentary of the site. This is not what we wanted to do. We actually wanted to employ game, gamifying techniques um, to make the user more engaged and to create a more Im immersive um, experience around this site. So we opted for a first-person experience, but what would be and what could be the point of view of that? And what's the point in history that we focus on? Now, Block 15 operated as an isolation and torture building between 1943 and 1944, just under one year. Um, so what point, at what point in the history or in the life of this building would we be focusing to tell its story, both the tangible and the intangible one? That was another tricky question, as you may understand. How do we account for the interactivity and freedom of movement within a concentration camp? I'm sure you understand if you put the headset on, you can't st start roaming freely within a concentration camp. That's out of the question. This is, of course, uh, absolutely inaccurate. So how would we go about that? And of course, what would be the, so to say, overarching storyline that would remain true to the history and um, do the building and the people around it justice, but at the same time keep the visitor slash user engaged. Now, the fact that I, this is a single author paper and it's just me standing here before you does not mean that it was just a, 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 an individual project, the one I'm describing. Far from that, it's a trans and interdisciplinary team that has been working and it's, it's still very much working on this project. And here you can see one of the first and very few face-to-face -face meetings we had in 2020, because remember, 2020 was uh, lockdown times for, uh, for most of us. This was summer 2020. When we first started discuss, discussing the issue of um, digital storytelling around this production, around Block 15. So the person you can see at, um, with a light blue shirt is called Yanis Ragos. He's my collaborator in the Block 15 project, and he's the one responsible for writing up the final scenario, the final script. 
He is an investigative journalist by profession, and he's also worked, um, he's also created quite a few scenarios of famous true crime uh, um, series in Greece. So he's really into, um, into this, this scope and this area of, um, of expertise. And the person looking at his phone in this picture in the black t-shirt, he's, um, he's a cinema director and illustrator who, act, who also helped us think around our resources, around our data in terms of interactivity and in terms of scenario building. Here were some of the first ideas we had, and the, uh, the ideas discussed by the, the team I showed you just before. So the guy you see uh, on your um, right, left-hand side, is um, the first commander of the camp, uh, Paul Radomski. He was, um, he was one of the cruelest commanders in German camps at the time, um, during the occupation, and uh, of course, it was on the table, it, it, it was one of the discussions that came to the table whether a Nazi or a German could be the actual first point, uh, f first person point of view. But of course not. I mean, we wouldn't ever uh, have um, our user, visitor um, uh, experience, you know, uh, become um, the oppressor. So this, this was dropped. And then our historians, because um, we have a team, in our team we have a few um, historians, experts in the 1940s in Greece, and I have to name the, the historian lead, that's Anna Maria Drumbuki from the University of Munich. She came to us and she said, you know, it can be a Red Cross officer, you know, because Red Cross people used to come and bring supplies to, to concentration camps. And we were all very happy because we'd finally found uh, our point of view. And then a few days later, and Yanis had already started working on the interactivity, she came back and she said, you know what, guys, um, wrong, count me, count this out, because Red uh, Cross officers would not go all the way inside the, the, uh, the, the army camp, the concentration camp. They would just leave the supplies at the front gate, and that would be it. So this was out of the table as well. So we were in point, um, point zero again. This woman that you see proudly standing, and this is a, to me it's a very powerful image, is, is the only living survivor of Block 15 right now. As far as I know, she's still alive. She's in, in her late 90s. Her name is Eleni Yorgada. And um, we were thinking of actually making you all become her and see, see the camp and the life um, um, within the concentration camp through her own eyes. But you know what? Block 15 was a solitary confinement just for male prisoners. So Elan Yorgada never had the chance to visit the act, to, to, to enter the actual building. So a woman, or Elan Yorgada in this case, was out of the question as well. So it was kind of frustrating. This is me giving a presentation of this project in a school. These are all 15 or 16 year old Greek school children. And I'm jumping a bit ahead before I give you um, what we think of as a solution to our problem and the way we decided to go about um, digital storytelling in this particular project. Uh, this is me, you know, reciting the actual problem that I'm reciting to you now and, you know, how would we go about it? What would you do? What would you do if you had to decide what decision would you make as to the point of view of, um, of a virtual reality concentration camp experience? And these are the answers I got. <laughs> so they, they can't really think outside the box, 15-year-olds. Um, so um, just before, you, before, you, before we start laughing, one of them, um, or quite a few of them actually said that perhaps the point of view would be that of a former prisoner that had been executed or released or, you know, after liberation, and perhaps a ghost going back into, into, the, into the army camp and, you know, flying over the army camp and telling, reciting the stories he, had, he or she had heard would be the best way forward. I actually found that the ghost, uh, the ghost option quite creative, um, uh, but, but we had already made up our minds. Now, the rat story is another, it was another suggestion by one of the students. Um, why not a small animal, they said. It was a young boy. Um, he, he identified himself as a gamer 
surprise, surprise. And he basically said, why not a rat? I mean, a rat can go anywhere, and they can see anyone. They can, they can crawl on people. They can see what they do. They can over, uh, overhear, uh, eavesdrop. But it's a matter of climax or scale in this, in this um, occasion. For one thing, I, I doubt that the German ministry and the Greek ministry would, you know, would keep funding us if we had you know, to make our users be you know, rats. But other than this, I mean, let's say they did. Um, rats see things through a different scale. So basically, um, that was out of the question as well. As, as was the bird's, eye, the bird's eye view, so like an eagle flying over block 15 and Haidari and you know, telling us the stories and looking at the story, zooming in, zooming out, out of the question. So what we opted instead of rats and ghosts and Nazis was to have, um, to have the user um, become a prisoner in block 15 during a 24-hour period at the later stages of the life of the, of the concentration camp in August 20, um, 1944. Um, you, you, the users, have been transferred to the concentration camp from a certain blockade. Um, so the, so the, the Germans have brought you over, and you get appointed to the kitchens. Now, if you get appointed to the kitchens, the kitchens have a very particular um, location within the camp. They can, know, they can look outside and see the entrance, uh, the gate, the entrance gate to the, to the actual um, concentration camp, and also look towards block 15 and navigate towards block 15. So you can get a pretty good idea of how block 15 looks on the outside. So you take on a mission, right, and this is where game, gamification comes in, to deliver a note from the women's block to another prisoner within block 15. So you interact with women, you have a certain, a certain freedom of movement within a, a time frame uh, in the army camp. Um, the action unfolds in 10 scenes in different parts of the camp, and you interact both with um, prisoners as well as with German officers. Some of them are real people, you know, they, they are based on, on actual true to true um, historic figures. And you also witness steady ongoing daily uh, events in the army camp, like the mor morning call, as well as, you know, pretty urgent situations as um, the deportation of, um, of a certain group of prisoners. Featured in the script, we also have some uh, actual person, and the user visitor is free to interact in, with objects and other people, you know, during the experience. I know I have, um, my time is very limited. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna show you just a glimpse of what we are, where we are right now. Of course, it's distorted, that's 2D. In 3D, you can see a very different thing. We should be able to get the sound, but that's okay. I have like a minute left. Um, for now, the production is in Greek and German. Um, it's going to be translated into English, the Greek parts, because the German parts are not going to be translated because this will um, is part of the immersive experiences. Prisoners within the uh, concentration camp didn't always or usually didn't speak German. So listening to somebody speaking a language you don't understand works towards immersion uh, very, uh, better. Now, this is an action point. Um, it's a trigger. And she's Eleni Yorgada. She looked when she was young. And during the production, you can hear her actual voice. We, are, we got license to reuse and repurpose um, her oral testimony as collected and curated within another project um, funded by the Greek German Fund for the Future. That's Memories of Occupation in Greece. So yes, it's a bit, it's a bit of, 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 of a clash, such a young woman speaking in an old woman's voice, but it is a powerful moment in the production. Let me move just a bit forward. So this is where um, you get the note. Okay, it doesn't really work very well with a shared screen. But I think um, this is me for now, as my um, esteemed chair is, is telling me. So thank you very much. Um, I'm open to discussion. Thank you very much.